Welcome to my channel, where the scariest stories come to life. Before we dive into today's chilling tale, make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications, so you never miss a story. Now, let's get into the horror. Like a lot of people, the early days of winter are really tough on my immune system. I always seem to get sick either when the temperature takes its first big dip or when we get our first big snowfall. This past winter, I got so sick that I actually had to call into work, which I've only had to do one other time in my career. My wife left for work at about 8 am that day, and I passed out on the couch shortly after, as I had been up for most of the night. So, this was some much needed sleep. I woke up a couple of minutes after 10, with my throat sore and dry, and my head congested and pounding. I laid there for a minute, trying to muster up the strength to get off the couch to get something to drink. I walked to the kitchen and got a cup of juice and a cup of ginger ale. On my way back to the couch, I walked by our living room window and noticed a light snowfall on the ground that must have accumulated while I was asleep. I stared for a minute, admiring the snow and taking the chance to stretch my legs before I returned to the couch for the majority of the day. Right before I turned back to the couch, I noticed footprints that started from the bottom of the driveway and went toward the wooden gate that led to our backyard. At first, I thought maybe they were from my wife. However, there wasn't snow on the ground when I fell asleep or when she went to work, so these tracks had to be fairly new. I went back into the kitchen and looked out the window into the backyard. I saw the footprints continue in the backyard and also noticed that the wooden gate was ajar, even though it was shut and closed with a padlock nightly. I threw my robe on and opened the sliding glass door to peek my head out and see if I could spot anything else. The cold breeze and snow on my face only made me feel more ill and made me want to retreat to the couch, but then I immediately got a rush of adrenaline seeing that one of my small basement windows was also ajar and left completely open. I was now in a state of panic, trying to think rationally or explain the situation to myself. My wife would never have opened the wooden gate or the basement window. No animal could have done this. The only logical explanation was that someone was in or trying to get into my house. I exited the kitchen, walked down the hall, and peeked my head around the staircase that led down into the basement. The stairs had traces of snow and puddles of water on them. Thinking quickly, I quietly but briskly got into the nearest closet and called the police from my cell phone. I whispered, not knowing where the intruder was or if they were even still in my house. Luckily, the 911 operator was able to hear me and told me to remain quiet until someone could arrive at my house for assistance. She stayed on the line with me as I heard someone come down the stairs from the second level of our house. It seemed like the person was walking around, looking for something specific, walking by the closet door several times at a fast pace. I did my best to hold in any sniffle, sneeze, or cough that I thought was coming to remain silent and undetected. I remember thinking that I didn't care what the person took, they could take anything they wanted. I just wanted to remain unharmed. After what felt like hours, but in reality was probably only a few minutes, I heard the whoop whoop of sirens outside. The cops knocked on the door, and after a few attempts, must have come around back and entered through the now unlocked sliding glass door. Even though the police made their presence known, the intruder was still in the house. They arrested him and brought him out. I didn't really hear much of a struggle, just the officers telling him to get down and put his hands behind his head. I stayed where I was, not moving until the cops opened the closet door and told me it was alright to exit. Apparently, the burglar hadn't tried to steal anything or, at least, didn't have anything of mine on him. However, upon further inspection of the man's vehicle, it looked like he had broken into several houses in the neighborhood and taken packages and other valuables from their homes. The police found a knife on him, but they told me they didn't believe he had intentions of using it. I think they said this just to make me feel better, as I don't know how they could have known the man's intentions. My wife and I were obviously shaken up by the ordeal. I can't put into words for those of you reading this story what effects incidents like this can have on you after the fact. Of course, you're scared in the moment, but ever since this happened, 
I've found it difficult to feel safe or to feel like my family is safe. It's a terrible feeling to not feel protected in your own home. We have since moved from that neighborhood, but the feelings of insecurity still remain. I've taken more proactive steps to ensure this doesn't happen again. We have state-of-the-art locks for our windows and doors, as well as a new security system. I also have an Akita guard dog to protect the house when I'm not home. As traumatizing as this event was, I'm still grateful that I woke up when I did and that something worse didn't happen. Growing up and spending my entire life in the northeastern United States, I can confidently say that I'm no stranger to snow and driving in the snow. If you're from a similar climate, I'm sure you would agree that driving in the snow is both annoying and dangerous. I live in a city that consistently ranks in the top 10 for nationwide snowfall each year. Dealing with this much inclement weather every year has turned me into a pretty good driver in the snow, or at least, that's what I thought on a night in February a few years ago. I was driving home from my girlfriend's house. It was 8 p.m. and had been snowing for most of the day. I went over to shovel out her driveway and make sure it was as clear as possible for her to get up and go to work the next morning. It usually took me about 10 to 15 minutes to get to or from her house, but so far, this drive had taken 30 minutes, and I was a little over halfway home. The roads and highways were mostly empty, but I was forced to go slower than normal, as I didn't want my car to get stuck or slide off the road. I had made it off the final highway, and now I just had side roads until I got back to my house. I was approaching an intersection, I think, one that had a four-way stop. And, of course, after I stopped and tried to start again, my car began fishtailing and wouldn't move. At this point, I was pretty tired and started to get frustrated. I hadn't been home from work yet, and I really just wanted to get out of the car in this weather. I tried rocking the car back and forth in the snow, but it wasn't working. I was digging myself into a deeper hole and probably wearing down some of the tread on my tires. I didn't know what to do. Should I call someone for help or try to dig myself out by hand? I certainly wasn't asking any of my family or friends to come out and try to help. I decided to get out of the car and try to kick some of the snow out from beneath my tires, hoping to regain traction on the road. As I was trying to dig out my tires, a random woman came up to me. She didn't say anything or offer to help or ask what was going on. She just stood there and stared at me. She then began walking towards the stop sign, her head now pulled over her head. I shouted, hey, are you okay? Do you need anything? She didn't answer. I was a little weirded out, but mostly annoyed with my car, and focused on that. After a few minutes on my hands and knees, using my snow brush to move snow out from under my tires, I got up to get back into my car. I saw the lady still standing in the same spot, and I yelled out, okay, well, have a good night then, probably sounding sarcastic and annoyed as I was in a crappy mood. Right as I opened my door to get back into the car, she finally spoke up and said, wait, in a monotone voice. I continued to open my door and looked at the woman, waiting for her to say something else. Then, in an eerie, unsettling, and almost manic voice, she said, that is my car. Not wanting any part of the situation and the obvious crazy person standing 30 feet away from me, I got into my car and closed the door. I started the car and again tried to rock myself out of the snow. Then I noticed that the woman was now standing in front of my car, probably close enough to touch the hood with her outstretched hands. If I tried to floor it and drive, I would have easily run her over. So, I started honking my horn and put the car in reverse. She moved after a few honks, but then came over to the driver's side door and started pulling at the handle. The doors were locked, but I was obviously still scared and confused as to what was going on. This is when things started to turn for the worse. She became aggressive and started pounding on the door, screaming loudly, this is my car, you beast. She kept referring to me as the beast and insisting I was in her car. Completely freaked out, I floored it, and thank God, I was finally able to fishtail out of that spot and move forward up the road. I looked back in my rearview mirror, and the lady was running after the car, waving her arms in the air. 
I tried my best to forget about the incident and not dwell on what her intent or reason was. Thanks for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed the story, don't forget to give the video a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a terrifying tale. See you in the next one.